Hi, and welcome back to SEO on Air. I'm your host, Aaron, and today we have Joshua Ubergang, Director at Digital Dots. We talk about how you can set up your Shopify account, SEO optimization tips, and how to address unique challenges in e-commerce. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Josh, <laughs> could you tell us a bit more about how you kind of got into SEO and digital marketing? It wasn't really, let's say, a straight line, I assume, right? A straight line, really, you know, so... I mean, SEO for me uh, began my dad who started with the classic, like you can Google how to make money online and that would probably be his route to digital marketing. So he, he had an abundance of courses that were used, that he, that he purchased but never used. And so with them, he kind of encouraged me coming out of university, coming out of high school, so 18 years old-ish with no clear direction for myself with what that next step looked like. And so he had his courses from guys, um, old names, like I haven't even heard their names for a while, like Mike Fulsamy, um, there's John Reese, who had created a course called Traffic Secrets. He was the first person ever to crack $1 million in a single day selling digital products. And so that, that was, like back, uh, probably back in 2000, he's a historical figure, I think, in the digital marketing world for what he did that day. Um, other guys like um, Frank Kern, Jeff Walker with his um, product launches, like all these guys had good courses and they kind of, so dad kind of got on the side of things with that, but I had never did it. And so he encouraged me and then I had an interest in doing it and particularly with John Reese's course of traffic secrets. He had different sections of uh, paid search, affiliate marketing, how to do them, versus, and then one on SEO. And I would say that was my first foray into SEO. And yeah, that, so that's 20 years ago. And what that looked like back then is- Would have been completely could, different. Yeah, you could plug into your keywords into meta keywords so today there's just a meta description like meta and description equals that and that's your description but then there's also meta keywords element which is still kind of used today but whoever, use, whoever uses it is not right. doesn't understand this yet because it hasn't worked for 10 years but you could plug your keywords into meta keywords and you could have a very successful seo strategy just through that and so, and so it's one of those things that in hindsight, a bit like if I purchased Amazon stock in 2005, right. <laughs> like if I had known these strategies or other, other SEO strategies involved in time, yeah, it's a different world. And so that's where I got my frame to SEO. And if you don't mind, when around that time was the introduction to digital darks? No, digital darts came a lot later um, in the various other ventures for myself and university jobs. I even had a little foray into security. So um, um, that was a change actually out of digital marketing into security. And I lasted three months in that because playing more cop was not fun. <laughs> Kicking it, it that's, that's like yeah. set up a good example, huh? No, that's what you have to deal with. Um, I didn't, didn't enjoy it getting threatened at midnight by drunks as you have to stand outside and protect a shopping center. Right. Um, but that's yeah. So digital darts started in 2015 on the back of like working in various e-commerce agencies. And so now just specialized, specialized in helping Shopify stores grow, um, through yeah, paid search, organic search, email, paid social, big channels. Um, so let's just say I am a business owner of the company Phones R Us. Um, we provide accessories and phones to pretty much everyone who needs it. Um, I have, let's say, a basic website where I've got a few content here and there. I've put a few, um, let's say, SEO tips and tricks I've learned from other podcasts. Um, but I'm trying to come, I've come to you now for a little bit of consultation because someone mentioned to me that um, Shopify would be a better platform to go for. And that's be something I should start my foundation from. Um, so my first question would be, as a business owner for, let's say, a phone company, uh, what would be, let's say, the first initial steps I can take to start off my Shopify store? Yep. Well, I have to commend the person who recommended you Shopify. It's 
this funny in the SEO space for whatever reason, like because of one or two elements that have often been worked on or improved that Shopify, some stores don't get recommended or it's seen as, it's seen as a limitation just because it's not a full, it's a closed system as opposed to WordPress. But I mean, the iterations of the product in, in itself has been so incredible for Shopify. And I can't, I've said this for years as well, like I've never has seen a store have the platform shop by itself be a limitation for SEO. It's often an, ex an excuse for, there's so many other factors as an SEO that you can control to improve on. And so um, in, in setting up, yeah, shop, shop fly, it's, it's incredibly easy with the speed to market. And so compared to what I was talking about earlier with um, say 2000, like, um, well, coming back to 2010, with, I'm not too sure exactly when Magento was the primary e-commerce platform, but you would launch with Magento. That's installing on your own servers and just finding a, a suitable server can be its own challenge. Install it. Then you have to find applications that work with Magento and they never do out of the box. And so then you a theme that's hardly configured for your store. And so you'd, on average, you'd spend six months configuring and just getting to market. Whereas, so with Shopify, you can set up a product, pick a free build theme, spend free. Although typically if you just go that extra notch of spending $250, you will get momental, a momentous more value in doing it. And yeah, one, if you have to say fulfilling, fulfilling out of your bedroom, you can be to market within that one day, um, which is ridiculous when you think about that. Like you don't you don't need to wait for merchant bank accounts to be approved and other setup processes. So yeah, it's getting getting your product set up um, primarily and picking a theme, and then some legal side of taxes. I mean, some argue some incorrectly advise otherwise, but you've got to do things by the books and don't skimp on what's legal because it will bite you in the long but, term. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Essentially have a fulfillment strategy. Um, that's okay. the basis. Um, so, you don't even, need, don't even need your own domain, but granted. Um, so, so let's say I kind of, um, take all of that into my uh, stride and I start my Shopify store. What would you think are some, let's say, common mistakes that you might see me make as a new person into it? I, I like to think of just starting out broad, particularly in frameworks. And so in the framework of SEO for Shopify, you've got the elements of on-page and off-page. And out of the box, you're already in good favor with a lot of on-page elements that are going to be sort of for you without having an awareness of them. So, um, first, first mistake that's probably made is, um, good original content on the page. And so in speaking of content, like in, on an e-commerce store, I think it's wrong to start from an SEO standpoint. Like you, your goal is to get sales through SEO. Um, not that they're contradictory, but often when you're writing, um, or yeah, writing for a search engine. Granted, no one ever says that you're supposed to write for a user, right. but in writing for a search engine, it changes. You're not thinking about the person that you are you know, persuading or what they need to know to make that purchase. So the problems, the solutions, the features. Um, so very generic, it happens even for a mature store, very generic product descriptions that don't provide any good content value for search engines, let alone like what they're there to serve users. And so that, that's one of the main things. And then uh, the second, and the second big mistake is how images are uploaded. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, I've seen plenty of times where they, if they do take their own photos, um, they might just take a raw, not a, not a raw file, but an unoptimized JPEG that's for 
1,000 uh, pixels by 4,000 pixels that gets rendered on the page at a size of um, 600 by 600. And so you're getting, yeah, whatever that is, like 10 times the image size that's condensed unnecessarily, which slows down page speed a lot. Um, but yeah, not even that, just the image file type as well. So with WebP, almost SVG being a bit of a standard format today. Um, no, I'd argue whether it's a standard format, but it's a very, yeah, it will be soon. Um, picking a good photo, but then often starting out, you, people in illegally copy other photos. And so with watermarks, if it's to a, a, an aware eye, different um, pictures that are taken from different angles across your product range, it looks ugly, like different models and different, like some, some are absolutely pixelated. And a third would be having your website probably no indexed um, and wondering why Google's not crawling it because um, some themes might not be part, it might be password protected still or um, internal linking might be a bit weak as content can be hidden from the homepage or hidden from a few clicks. But typically, typically that indexation is not a big problem for Shopify because it'll automate, it automatically creates a sitemap for you um, at forward slash sitemap.xml. And so it's able to detect that pretty quickly all the pages within the website. Worries. Um, if I were to approach digital darts to help me with my SEO marketing in terms of um, my Shopify site, um, what would be some, let's say, initial steps you could take? Yep. Yeah, yep. And the absolute best way to start with that would be an audit and hope that would be the number one thing that would be brought up every time in that discussion and audit. Um, kind of on the back of what your goals are as a business. So in, in an audit, yeah, looking at a, a checklist of working off that framework that I said for on page, off page, um, yeah, starting through typically in Shopify, you have I think it's five, six different types of content. So um, collections, collection pages, also known as categories. There's product pages, then there's pages themselves. So this is often this is often marked in Shopify by a sub folder structure. So you'd have like your your phones are us forward slash collections forward slash collection name. And so same with products, forward slash products and product name or forward slash pages, pages name. So there's those three, then you got like blogs, which house articles. So that's kind of two additional content types. Then yeah, some might like your homepage or a sub collection page. And so treating each one as its own silo with what you look at for uh, a title element, meta description element, other content on the page, like H1, H2, H3 tags, looking at the structure of that. And then even more so with e-commerce, I think schema markup and structured data, being able to understand. There's, there's definitely some unique structured data elements for e-commerce that a store should have that can make SEO a lot easier. Like some that come to mind, like product markup and review markup that bring about the golden stars in search results. Um, and just recently, Google have denied the FAQ markup, which made for a lot of easy wins in SEO. So um, this is a technical side. Can the website be crawled and understood? What's the kind of measuring the health of it? Has the website been penalized in the past? There's a few good tools to do that. Um, a simple one, the most obvious one is Google Search Console looking at manual actions. Another one that comes to mind is I think Barracuda um, Analytics, Barracuda Digital. They've got a cool tool where you're able to overlay, you integrate your Google Analytics traffic into history of algorithm updates. And so you're able to impose any fluctuations in your organic traffic with algorithm changes. Um, yeah, looking at so part of the indexation health measurement is looking at the number of pages that are indexed versus what you actually have on the website and sometimes with shopify 
you get you have to create pages that you don't want to exist on its own URL in order to have the content that you want in some sections. And so you don't want those pages indexed. And so eliminating that. And then on, yeah, on the back of a health check, you can have like a site architecture check. So that's kind of what I talked about before with H1 tags, other markup, scheme markup, and various other elements of that. Um, yeah, I can keep going through the through the uh, order process if you're interested. Otherwise, um, I mean, I'll I'll try to kind of just throw in a little question just to kind of change it up. Let's say I have now some yeah. good traffic coming to the website. I have taken care of my SEO health. Um, I wouldn't say it's perfect. Uh, there are a few tweaks I can still make. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is that while I'm getting this traffic, um, there are a lot of people yeah. who are kind of clicking away. So how do I kind of, let's say, improve my, well, click-through rate and conversion? From kind of two problems, the click and the conversion. Right. Um, yeah. to, the, to the main, I guess, your main question of why people are clicking away, that's what has changed in, a, that's what Google themselves have kind of acknowledged more in Google Analytics 4 by looking at what they call engagement metrics. And so... I mean, bounce rate doesn't actually exist anymore because that's what we've measured. And so engagement, for example, might be um, going to a page, watching a video, um, downloading a checklist, all through like a pop-up, like a highly engaged session that might last 20 minutes and then someone bounces back. And from a traditional SEO perspective, that would be looked at as a failure. They've engaged with one page on the website and haven't done like anything else, but they've consumed the content. They've stayed for 20 minutes. They've most likely achieved their objective of whatever they were searching. You may have even collected an email address for, to move them down into the middle of funnel, bottom of funnel marketing and that's yeah, a huge success. So uh, actually understanding what that means first, is that is their search query actually being fulfilled? And a bounce is not necessarily a point of failure. So um, how would I then get these to be, let's say customers now? While they are engaging with my website and they are staying there, they might not be bouncing away, but- Sure, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that example that I gave actually captures it quite well with um, that email collection. So e email is without a doubt, like it's, I've been saying it for so long, so many other people have been saying it for so long, is an underused platform. And so in thinking about email capture, it's, it's such a good way to be able to push people through say, that, that content that they've discovered to a middle of the funnel, to a bottom funnel where they ultimately, ultimately purchase like there's a classic marketing cliche that, which I don't believe in, but there's often truths and cliches that people need to hear from a business seven times before they buy. And I mean, plenty of times we can buy the first time we hear from the business on other more high value purchases, you may, may end up having 30 times. And so that email capture is without doubt the best source of furthering someone from a cold source. And so then the question becomes, how do you do that? And from an, an SEO standpoint, um, if it's, it depends on the type of content that someone's searching and what they're landing on, the best thing you can do is for say an article piece or a guide is to question how can you deliver extra value on top of what they're searching for that doesn't detract the, the solution that they need for what they, they're querying on. And so let's give an example of that. Um, we have a Google Analytics guide on the website. And so someone might search how to do, how to set up Google Analytics and Shopify. And they fully get how to do that. But 
we have uh, audit, I've developed an audit where it's like a Google Sheet that 30, 40 steps that someone can download, enter the email, that can they work side by side as they go through the guide that makes it easier to go through the guide. And so it's a, it's a supplementary piece of content that kind of supports the greater piece. And so, if, yeah, if people <laughs> go to a page and expect to, and need the solution and all they can do is opt in. <clears throat> I mean, you may actually get increased opt-in rates, but I mean, from an SEO perspective, it's not going to, it's not going to succeed because you don't get that high bounce rate of people bouncing back to search results to get someone who's actually hiding content behind a gate, gate of the wall. Uh, when yeah. it does come to, let's say, some of these content pieces, uh, how likely are you to recommend chat GPT and other tools like that? It's a form of what Nadal Ravikant would say, leverage. So he describes leverage as content, code, capital, and um, collaboration, four Cs. And so if in the content, if, or even code as well, like AI, feeds that speed at which it can be produced. So it's a form of leverage. And so it's not a question of necessarily how it's done. A person in-house, a person outsource or AI, it's what goes into that. And so without a doubt, uh, like we yes, use AI all the time um, because it's such a fantastic form of leverage. And so what matters is particularly to chat GPT is the prompt. And right. so that's just about feeding, knowing how to work with AI to get the insight that you need. When it comes to, let's say, customer reviews, would it be that horrible to kind of use AI to reply to some of them? Or would it still be recommended to personally go and actually reply to them? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely applications that are already doing that. And so it's an abundant thing already. I mean, it's not very different to... Um, of the best s s support software in Shopify is gorgeous. And for years, they've had template structures where you can have like, across any social platform, Facebook, Instagram, to email, um, you can have template answers that will have a hot, um, someone, say, chasing an order. You can have a template that then Hi, this is your order. Then with a template placeholder that fills in the order ID or a link to their order ID with information and other details for that. And so that's, it's the question is not how, again, how it's done. It's are you actually solving the problem, a form of leverage in an efficient way. Um, if you're <laughs> spilling out AI that doesn't actually solve customer support problems, Right. You're doing more damage without a doubt. Yeah, so, it kind of spells a recipe for disaster. Yeah, so if someone's in wrestling with that, definitely come back to that Naval Ramakant's four points of leverage. Like. So how exactly can I use link building in 2023 to help my large e-commerce store? And what are some, let's say, common mistakes that you probably will see me make? Well, congratulations on growing in one of the most competitive Thank markets. You. We had good help from Digital Dots for that, so yeah. kudos to them. Got to celebrate that win first. And in terms of yeah, link building strategy, I've I've never, we never approach it just from maybe some others might as well like do all on page and then shift towards off page aspects. Um, it's often side by side approach, um, and so at least in that standpoint, if it was to be done with link building, there's yeah definitely a couple of um, high leverage activities that can be done that are even like, unique to e-commerce. Um, but that work with the whole business. And so the, in thinking about what's the highest impact, highest impact and lowest effort, it's existing um, brand dimensions. So places where the website, the products itself, might be mentioned on blogs or other company websites. Um, news outlets are typically hard to get brand dimensions because they're one and done published. So 
but anyway, just a compiling list of branded mentions and then that aren't linked and then reaching out to them. So you go, you've got your direct brand name, that's the most obvious one, but then some other ones that people don't think of is um, people in the company who are related to it, who may have been mentioned or have even written pieces on the past through other websites and product, product names as well. Um, and so these are the heavily branded ones, but then you've got even um, kind of um, um, non-branded variations with um, the, if there's discussions on um, phone cases, um, like I mean, there's link insertion strategies that can be done, which can be paid, but yeah, finding ways in outreach to contact bring value to it's relationship based. Many people just don't un understand or underestimate in um, Right. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, so many other strategies that would apply with guest articles is a guaranteed way. It's, it still works. People have said it stopped working how many years ago, it still works. I mean, they kind of said backlinks and they wouldn't really work out as much. They wouldn't have that much effect also, but that's also pretty much working. Yeah. And so, yeah. So yeah. And then it's some aspects of it is generally just creative in your thinking as an SEO. And so what, what resources do you have in the, in your current company or ones that you're working for and how, how can you kind of reuse that? in a creative aspect or a newsworthy aspect or to get mentions. If I reached out to, let's say an agency like Stan Ventures, who will kind of help me with my backlink building activities, um, would you have, let's say, some tips and tricks for something like that? Or would you kind of advise me not to do that? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, by all means, I mean, plenty of people use third parties for link building. And so, it's about understanding what you're seeking to accomplish through your ventures and like and measuring what's being done. And so, um, yeah, measuring as in whether it's a particular link on a certain link criteria or um, content piece published on a certain related website that is of certain quality. Um, but then it also helps when you outsource to understand other what what metrics do you actually care about? Why why are you doing it? Because so many you have a basis, a basic understanding of a foundation to be able to manage someone who has a better understanding and together that lets you work together better. So it's a form of leverage, just like what we talked about at the start, in using people. Uh, people as a source of leverage is just one form. So again, it's not <laughs> If you do it, it's how you do it that matters. So thanks a lot for the chat, Josh. Hope we, hopefully we can get you again for another episode. Well, I appreciate having me, Aaron. It's good to talk with you. Thanks for watching that episode. I hope you enjoyed. For more videos like this, make sure you like and subscribe.